Today I'm braving the wind and the rain in Sonoma, California because I was finally able to get my hands on the new all-wheel drive version of Nissan's Aria electric crossover. This is Nissan's first all-wheel drive high horsepower EV available in the United States. Nearly 390 horsepower and still a very big boxy practical cargo area behind. You want to take a look at the Aria if you're looking at an Ionic 5 or an EV6 or a Mustang Mach-E and you want something that's perhaps a little bit more traditional, obviously something with a Nissan logo up front, and certainly something that is a lot less expensive than a lot of the competition. Let's take a look. From a design standpoint, I think Nissan did exactly what they needed to do. This looks nothing like the Nissan Leaf. It's a lot more exciting and definitely looks more futuristic as well. We have well-integrated, very slim LED headlights, not a separated LED headlight thing like we find in some EVs, fog lights down there at the bottom. There is very little exterior differentiation for the dual motor version of the Aria. There is a slight trim difference around the side and that's basically it. The LED accent lights up front definitely mimic the grille that we find in other Nissan products. And as you can see, they turn into the turn signal, which is a really cool design. The little slats in front of the front fenders, those are actually functional air vents to help direct air around the vehicle. The Aria was designed to turn over a new leaf for Nissan's electrification strategy. We have a liquid cooled battery pack, not an air cooled battery pack like we find in the leaf. And this is much larger than the Leaf as well. It's about 183 inches long, so about the same size as the Nissan Rogue. Although you'll notice that the roofline definitely drops a bit towards the rear, sort of like a Nissan Murano. We have significantly wider tires than we find on a Rogue or a Leaf as well. 255 with tires and nearly 7 inches of ground clearance. So unlike some EVs like the EV6 or the Mustang Mach-E or the Ionic 5, this has more ground clearance. So if you're concerned about winter performance, driving through snow, maybe even mild off-roading, know that the Aria is going to be a little bit more capable than some, but it's not as high off the ground as the Toyota Busy Forks. Yes, I called it a Busy Forks and the Subaru Solterra. The other big change is behind this door where we don't find a Chatamo connector anymore. Nissan has finally gone to a CCSDC fast charge connector. That's the standard that pretty much everything in North America is supporting going forward. An important thing to know about the Aria is that even though there is a less expensive front wheel drive version of the Aria with a smaller battery pack, this is not replacing the Leaf in the lineup, at least not for now, and that Leaf is not getting the CCS charge connector. Moving to the rear, we find full LED taillight modules, including LED amber turn signals. That's definitely my preference. We also find something that's pretty rare in an EV. We have a rear windshield wiper. So if you're a fan of rear wipers, I know Brian is, then know that we get one here in the Aria and you don't find one in most of the competition. When you look at this, it looks like the rear end is very steeply raked, but if I were to open this hatch, you'll notice we get a fairly tall vertical section right here that really helps improve cargo practicality. When designing the Arias platform, Nissan opted for a very short hood profile and a longer body behind. This is definitely different than we find in the Model Y and the Mach-E, where they certainly have a big front trunk under here, but that's mainly because the hood is considerably longer, and you'll really notice how short this profile is. Under here, we find mainly vehicle electronics and, of course, the front electric motor. There are going to be several different electric motors on the Aria depending on the version you choose. There are going to be two different battery packs, 63 kilowatt hours and 87 kilowatt hours, usable capacity, liquid cooled and actively heated as well. If you get the front wheel drive model, you'll get just over 210 horsepower with the small battery pack, 238 with the bigger battery pack. If you opt for the dual motor setup, that power level bumps up considerably. The small motor model, 335 horsepower, big motor model, 389 horsepower and 442 pound-feet of torque. Obviously, range is going to be the longest in the front-wheel drive big battery model, but even the all-wheel drive big battery model will still get a respectable 272 miles of range. This particular model, the Platinum trim, drops that down to 267 because of some of the added weight of the options and, of course, the wheel and tire package on this model. The interesting twist is going to be that standard range all-wheel drive version. Again, 335 horsepower, but just 205 miles of range. So if you want all-wheel drive, you want to spend a little less money, it is going to be a little bit slower than this, but the difference is probably not going to be huge. Hopefully I'll be able to get my hands on that soon because that's the model that really intrigues me. Charging happens behind door number one. There's an onboard 7.2 kilowatt level two EVSE that could take this battery from zero to 100% full in about 14 hours. That is slower than the onboard EVSEs we find in the Hyundai, the Kia, and the Ford modern EVs. But it may or may not matter, because in order to charge faster than 7.2 kilowatts, you do need to have a beefy EVSE at home and the electrical architecture to support it. And me, at home, I don't have that. So I charge at about 3.3 kilowatts at home, about 6.6 .6 kilowatts at the office. 
So in my situation, this would not charge any slower or any faster than pretty much any other EV out there. But if you do have the ability to install a faster EVSC at home and you want to charge faster, you should definitely keep that in mind. The DC fast charge peak rates are also a little bit slower than some of the competition. 130 kilowatts peak will take this from 10% to 80% in about 40 minutes. That's about double the time you'll find in the Hyundai and Kia EVs, but pretty similar to the Ford Mach-E. Since it is definitely very wet outside, let's talk about rear seat comfort a little bit differently. Back here in the rear seats, you can see I have a little bit of headroom left, about an inch or so, and you'll notice that the side is not as close to my head as it is in something like the EV6. This certainly has a boxier profile as it goes to the rear. You'll also really notice that the rear bench seat is wider, so the distance between the door and me is definitely wider than average for a compact crossover, and I have more legroom than average, maybe about four and a half, five inches there or so with this front seat comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall. This is the kind of vehicle where you could very easily put rear-facing or forward-facing child seats behind an adult up front. This front seat is all the way back in its tracks and a little bit more reclined. There would still be enough room for a child seat behind. And thanks to the width of this rear bench seat, you would definitely have enough room for maybe three seats or two seats and a booster. In this center armrest, we have two large cup holders there, and rear seat passengers get air vents, heated rear seats, and USB charge ports. Moving up front, taller drivers are definitely going to be happy. I have about an inch and a half of headroom, even though this model has the large panoramic moonroof, and obviously the moonroof is going to occupy a bit of room. That's just due to the more upright profile we have here. This Platinum trim has a multi-way power adjustable driver seat with four-way adjustable lumbar support. Unfortunately, the power passenger seat has no adjustable lumbar support at all. As we look around the interior, keep in mind this is the top end trim, but the interior is identical between the single motor and dual motor versions. Moving up from there, we find a large panoramic moonroof in this trim, and it does open. Just the front section right here, this is a fixed glass panel behind. But it also has an opaque shade, so if you're interested in an EV with an opening moonroof and one that completely blocks the light off, this may be an excellent option for you. Moving down from there, we find two-way adjustable headrests for the driver and front passenger, height adjustable shoulder belts, and definitely an eccentric shape to that headrest design. This interior has a very striking blue and charcoal two-tone interior, and kind of an interesting feature for an EV, these are Napa leather seats. Yes, real cow. So if you actually want leather in your EV, this is gonna be a great option, but obviously there are different upholstery choices in here if you would rather not have real leather in your car. Moving over to the front doors, we have a high percentage of soft touch and premium materials. This is sort of a faux suede section right here on the upper section of the door, and it continues around the vehicle. There is a band of it right here on the pillar, and then it continues right here around the rear door. Going back up front, we have decent bolstering on the front seats, but they are a little bit wider than the seats that we find in the Ionic 5 and EV6. This should be easier for larger folks to find a comfortable driving position. Moving in closer to that front door trim, you'll see the little white specks there inside that grid pattern. This is actually an ambient lighting panel meant to imitate a Japanese lantern. Uh, it does illuminate at night, but in the strong lighting right now, it's a little bit difficult to see. Moving over to the dashboard, more of that ultra suede interior runs in a bar right across the dashboard. It actually basically runs completely around the interior. It's a really attractive design. Moving down there to the bottom, between the footwells, you can see that pattern illuminated in that ambient lighting section right there. And then that same pattern continues on the floor mats inside the Aria, which is a cool touch. The glove compartment is a combination bin and slot style compartment, and I had no problem fitting larger tablet computers inside. The strong line running across the dashboard is a design theme that we see in a number of EVs. It is sort of a rose gold color, I guess you could say, and it joins the air vents together, and it also aligns with these buttons here. These are toggles for track forward, backward, the hazard light right there. Then we have power and volume for the infotainment system right there in the middle. Just below that, we have a touch button bank for the climate control system. What's interesting about these controls is that they're really well integrated with this imitation wood section that runs right across the dashboard. This isn't real wood, but it is actually quite convincing. Over there to the left, we find the power button for the vehicle, and again, that illuminated section below. Working our way down the center console, we have the joystick style shifter, control for the automated parking system, the one pedal drive mode, a drive mode toggle itself there, and then touch controls for this power storage area that descends from the dashboard. It's a really big storage bin. You can see how large it is if I toss in a larger smartphone, and there is a little lid if you wanna close that off. But obviously not enough uh, room or no provision rather for a cable to hang out from there. Now, speaking of that cable, let's see where that actually connects to the vehicle 
it is right down there. It's actually a little bit difficult to see from this angle. It's just under this powered center console section. Now, the powered center console is kind of a cool touch. The controls are over here on the driver's side, and you can see it opens up this really large area there. You can put a smartphone in that little area. You can tie up your cord with that. But because of the sliding console design, there's actually not as much storage going on here as you'll find in some. We have two cup holders there. We have the padded center armrest, which opens to reveal a fairly small storage area with a Qi wireless charge mat, small storage cubby behind, but there's no under console storage area because of that power sliding mechanism. I have to say this is kind of a neat touch because it brings the controls, the USB ports, and the air vents really close to the passengers in the rear. Obviously, if you had someone in the middle, that would be kind of tricky because they would really be straddling that console. But on the other hand, it really highlights that flat floor and gives this almost a 1980s bench seat vibe from this perspective. And in case you're wondering what it looks like when the console is completely in place, no problem fitting size 11 shoes back here, so a person in the middle would have absolutely no problem. Moving back to the dashboard, this dual screen setup is standard, and you'll notice from this angle that the screens are definitely very curved, and they're curved in different ways. One's concave and one's convex. You see this one actually kind of bows out there towards the driver, and that one pushes away from the driver. They claim that's to give it better focal distance for the driver. And then we have some touch controls in the middle, a button for the camera and a button for the dimmer. You can see here the 360 degree camera system that's available. And then we get a very similar full LCD instrument cluster view to what we see in other Nissan products. You can even opt for regular dials if you so prefer. The steering wheel offers a flat bottom design with some aggressive sport grips up top, but no paddles on the back for adjusting the regen braking. The only ways to adjust the regen braking are really just the drive modes. We have drive, we have B for enhanced braking, and then we have the E-step button for even more aggressive braking. On top of the steering column, you can see the camera module. That's part of the driver monitoring system because this does have Nissan's new hands-free driving assistance software. Down here, we find the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control and that semi-autonomous software. And then on the other side, we find controls for the infotainment system and the controls, not just for this uh, LCD instrument cluster, but also the color heads up display that Nissan says is gonna be standard on about 90% of Aria trims. Heads up displays are notoriously difficult to film, but this one is crisper than the one that we find in the Kia EV6 and offers very similar functionality. It's full color. It gives us the status of the active cruise control system. I'm not driving, so I can't show you that right now. Also turn by turn navigation directions. And to give you an idea of how large the display is, you can see the boundaries of that display right there on your screen. And again, this is gonna be in approximately 90% of the trims of Aria that are sold. While we're talking about the steering wheel, one cool touch in here is that we have a powered memory-linked steering column, something that we don't find in too many EVs, even some that are a lot more expensive than this. Now it's time to get the dual motor model out on the road. The first thing you'll notice obviously is the extra power, but also the extra traction. Now these tires are definitely scrabbling a little bit because this road surface is very wet, but it's still much better traction, of course, than you'll find in the single motor model and definitely swifter zero to 60 times. The slowest single motor version is gonna be about seven and a half, zero to 60, about 7.2 for the fastest version that I drove last time. This model, according to Nissan, should be about 4.8 seconds. And that feels about right in my initial driving here. I would not be surprised if the slightly less powerful standard range all wheel drive model ended up very similar to this because the battery is smaller and therefore the battery is lighter. Compared to the competition, this battery pack is fairly large. This is approximately a 93 kilowatt hour nominal battery pack, so only a little bit smaller than the one that we find in the Mustang Mach-E. And that's why, in terms of curb weight, the Aria and the Mach-E are quite similar to one another. Something like an EV6 definitely appears to be a little bit lighter than this, depending on the trim level you're looking at. And that's the logical reason that the EV6 is a bit quicker than this if we're talking about the regular all-wheel drive versions compared to this model, even though that horsepower figure is lower at about 320 horsepower versus nearly 390 horsepower in this model. It's a bit difficult to talk stopping distances because of course it is really wet out here at the moment, but this does have pretty wide tires for an EV in this size and price category. 255 width tires on this trim are the approximate equal of the top end trim EV6, as long as we're not talking about the GT model and of course the Ionic 5 as well. Also, very similar in width to the tires that we find on the Tesla Model Y, and those are significantly wider than the ones on the Mach-E, decently wider than the tires available on the ID4 as well. So we have a reasonable amount of rubber on the road, but a little bit more curb weight to contend with than you'll find in an EV6 or an Ionic 5. 
In fact, in many ways, this Aria slots right between a lot of these other competitors, which I think is a really good place to be in. The ride quality is not quite as polished as the Ionic 5 or the EV6 in my opinion. I actually ended up driving up here in the EV6, that's a GT line, so not the full-on GT. But that EV6 and the related Ionic 5 seem to soak up the smaller imperfections on the road a little bit better than this Aria. The Aria transmits a bit more of those into the cabin. But uh, in an interesting twist, if I were to wobble the steering wheel, this definitely has a bit more body roll, a bit more tip and dive than we find in the EV6 or the Ionic 5. I think that's simply due to Nissan's tuning of the suspension and their desire to give this notably more ground clearance than we find in the Hyundai or the Kia. Unfortunately, I have not been able to give the handling as much of a test as I would like, again, thanks to the rain out here, but logically, you should expect the handling ability to fall between worlds as well. I would expect this to handle better than the Mach-E because we have relatively similar curb weight, but we have wider tires, and just the tuning of the suspension, I think, is also a little bit uh, better oriented to that. We have a perfect 50-50 weight balance in this extended range battery dual motor model, a slight front weight balance if you get the smaller battery pack. On the other hand, you could logically expect handling to be a little bit better in the EV6, the Ionic 5, and Model Y, depending on the versions you look at, because of the tire choices, suspension tuning, and curb weights in those models as well. But one thing you won't find in most of the competition outside of the Cadillac Lyric or the Mustang Mach-E is a hands-off-the-wheel steering assistance system. Now, on this road surface, unfortunately, I cannot use it because this road is not HD mapped. There are certain requirements, much like we find in Blue Cruise and Super Cruise, on this road, I can only engage the aggressive steering assistance system. I can't engage the hands off the wheel steering system. The system will, however, be available on over 200,000 miles of paved roadway, mostly interstates and, of course, U.S. highways. The system works fairly well. If you want to see how well, check out our other video on that. I was able to drive the front-wheel drive version of the Aria for miles and miles on interstate out in Tennessee, and the system worked really, really well. I think it is certainly more polished than Blue Cruise, but not quite as polished as the latest version of Cadillac Super Cruise. As far as cabin noise scores go, it's a little bit difficult to tell because, again, wet roads, all of that. But this appears to be a relatively hushed cabin, even with the wider tires on it. I would say this is definitely going to be the equal of the Ionic 5 and the EV6. It appears to be a little bit quieter than the Mustang Mach-E, but for those official numbers, you'll have to wait until I can get this at home and run it through my usual battery of comparisons and tests. Same thing goes for the fuel efficiency. I have been averaging 2.5 miles per kilowatt hour so far today, but earlier in the day, it was raining absolute cats and dogs. There was water all over the roads. Obviously, that's going to have a major impact on vehicle efficiency. And right now, I have been running the heater. I actually have the cabin set to 80 degrees because I am trying to dry out. And that's obviously going to be using a lot more energy as well. Now, that said, it appears that efficiency, at least according to the EPA numbers, should slot right between something like the EV6 and the Ford Mustang Mach-E. Both of those vehicles have relatively similar range figures to this, but they have differently sized battery packs. And you'll notice that the EV6 will go further on a smaller battery. The Mach-E won't go as far as this on a bigger battery. So it's right there in between those worlds. Nissan did a pretty good job balancing the priorities with the Aria, although I wish that this dual motor model had been the one that had launched first, because I think that really would have put the Aria brand in a better starting position than some of the initial reviews that you might have read or seen online for that front wheel drive model. This is certainly going to be more fun, it's certainly going to be faster, and that might be enough, along with its lower price tag, to convince some folks that maybe they don't need the fast DC fast charging that you find in some of the competition. I should also mention that battery life is going to be one of the reasons you might not want one of those faster DC fast charging EVs. Battery lifetime is definitely a function of how rapidly you go from one state of charge to the other. We don't know good figures on the eGMP vehicles from Hyundai and Kia as far as their battery lifetime goes, but I would suspect that this battery pack might last a bit longer based on the slower charge rate, the chemistry of this battery pack. It is a CATL battery pack and the amount of reserve that Nissan is not letting you access. There is at least six kilowatt hours of battery pack that you simply cannot use. It's simply reserved for longer battery life. Now, on the downside, because of where this battery pack is manufactured and the fact that this is manufactured in Japan, the entire vehicle, it's not going to qualify for the $7,500 federal tax credit. However, you should be able to get the tax credit if you lease an Aria because for some reason the leases don't have to follow the same rules. If you're looking to get your hands on the Aria, the front wheel drive models are already on sale and you'll be able to get your hands on the all wheel drive version right around the time that you're watching this video. The base model with the standard range setup and all wheel drive is going to start just over $47,000. All the bells and whistles, it's going to come in just over $60,000. 
That pricing range is relatively narrow, certainly narrower than we find in the Ford Mustang Mach-E lineup, and not far off where we see some of the trims of the Korean competition. Keep in mind the Aria is not going to charge as quickly as the EV6, which was our EV of the year last year, but this is much more practical inside, especially that back seat. It's much more comfortable for adults. It's going to be much easier to put child seats, things like that, in the vehicle as well. So definitely keep that in mind. The Aria is also going to be less expensive than the Tesla competition. Let me know what you think of all of that down there in the comment section below, and I'm going to go inside where I can get dry because I am now soaked absolutely to the bone. But if I were looking for something that was more cargo practical, more family friendly, more second row accommodation friendly in the EV segment, I would certainly put the Aria on my shopping list. It doesn't ride as nicely as some of the competition, but it is significantly smoother than the Mach-E or the Model Y. Those are solid reasons to buy this. Now on the downside, we do have that slower charging. I don't know if that is of issue to you, but for some folks, it definitely will be a consideration. Range is not a problem, but the slower charging speeds could limit its appeal for some folks out there. Let me know what you think. Find us at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of those social places, and stay dry out there. Hopefully it is not raining where you are.